you very much. Hello. Um, so, yes, yeah, so you've heard um, Richard and Henry talk very eloquently about VR and AR. What I'm going to do here is try and give you some examples of where we think the opportunities lie now for brands. So, in my role at Jorn, it's essentially to go out, talk into brands, talk into organisations, and make them realise this kind of underlying power of VR. Now, I, make it, I may at some point sound like I'm part of some kind of VR cult, and, and I realise this, but it's fundamentally because um, I have such, you know, there's such passion. People that are in this industry, we do share this real passion for how powerful it is. And I know, as Henry's talked about, we have a way to go before we reach mass adoption on the headset scale. But actually, what I want to do here is kind of dive into just why we're so passionate about this and where actually the opportunities lie for brands. So for those of you who don't know about Jaunt, we are a company founded in Silicon Valley about four years ago. Um, we basically are, we see ourselves as a kind of VR media company. We specialize in producing and distributing VR content. So we have a number of attributes on the creative side, the production side, and we also focus a lot on actually when you make VR content, how you get people to experience that content. Because obviously, you can make the best content in the world, but if no one sees it, it's, it's pretty pointless. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whiz through this. So Jaunt Studios, we have a studio based in LA, in Santa Monica. Over the last four years, it's actually about 250 productions now. Uh, if you go onto our website, jauntvr.com, you'll see an absolute a massive array of content we've made. Uh, work, won quite a few awards, worked with a lot of different partners. Uh, and essentially, what we try to do is make sure that as VR, as I'm sure you all know, is an entirely new paradigm of content creation, we realise that actually the key when you're talking to brands and when you're working in creating VR content, it's so important that the kind of ideation stage at the beginning is correct. Because ultimately, if you make VR for the sake of doing VR, if you make VR and don't utilise the core strengths of VR, it's entirely pointless. It, it's, as you may have seen over the last few years, there's been a lot of kind of hyperbole around the industry. A lot of content has been made that doesn't always really utilize the core strengths of VR, which I'll touch on in a minute. And what we always try to do is, is recognize that when you make VR, when someone takes that headset off, there has to be a defined purpose. If you are a customer, you take that headset off, if you don't feel anything, it's, in, it, it's a waste of time. They have to... You have to make sure that you're starting with what you want that user to feel like when they experience that piece of content. Um, we have a number of techno technology in the background, but essentially what we try to do is we have our Jaunt VR app. And it's available on iPhone and Android. You can watch the content either in kind of magic window mode or in cardboard headset. But also we have um, the Jaunt VR application available on every single hardware platform because we recognise the market at the moment is pretty fragmented, as, as Henry touched upon. There's a lot of different technology, a lot of different manufacturers, all shouting about various tech. And for a lot of brands, it can get very confusing. And for consumers, it can get confusing. So what we try to do is make sure that when we work with a brand, the content that we make gets automatically pushed across the Jaunt VR app on all of these platforms, meaning you haven't got to develop bespoke apps for every single platform, which can obviously be costly and, and laborious. Um, so I guess in working out why we're so passionate about VR, this is a, a kind of a, a quote I like quite a lot. This idea that VR forges a connection like no other media, and, and I really, really believe this. I think if you look at the strength of VR, it's the idea of this kind of ticket you can't buy. It's, it's transporting people to situations they couldn't otherwise be in. It's, it's giving someone an experience that they cannot have in normal 16.9. If you are watching TV, then for a lot of people, that's an experience we've been used to over generations, right? And it's taken us years and years to perfect 16.9. But actually, when you create an, a VR experience that really utilises the strength of the platform, you can create a connection with the end user that you cannot get with any other form of media. And this kind of boils down to a number of key points, which I'm sure you've heard before. This, first of all, this kind of sense of presence, right? This idea that in VR, you can really trick the brain. And there's a lot of scientific research done by people far more intelligent than I am. But this idea that VR can transport you to someone, it can trick your brain into believing that you were there. It, it tricks the brain into believing that you are present in that situation. And, there, and therefore, as a result, what you get is a really heightened sense of awareness. And actually, as I'll come on to, your, your brain is much more then open to receiving information. And at the same time, if you, if you insert people into that situation, what you get is intimacy. This is a bit of content we did um, with, a, with a band that I, I can't remember the name of. Um, but you're, you're on the tour bus. Now, you know, ultimately, if you do a bit of uh, content and you're just watching a concert, that's, something, that's a ticket you can buy. You can go to a concert. There's various ways of doing it, obviously. 
But something like this is an experience you couldn't normally get. You're there with the band, they're talking, they're playing to you. We did a bit of content with Paul McCartney where you're there in his private recording studio and he's looking directly at you and he's, he's playing for you. And it feels like an intimate experience. You're there, you're, you know, he's talking to you, he's playing for you. And that ultimately, is, again, is an experience that you cannot get in normal media. Um, and when you get both of those correct, what you get is emotion. You, you elicit this sense of emotion from people and you only have to look at some of the content that's been created by charities. You know, some of this stuff is so powerful. I mean, incredibly powerful. The, be the piece of uh, work that's been done around the Alzheimer's Society, the, I think the Autistic, the Autism Society, created a bit of film where you're in a shopping centre as a child with autism, and it kind of brings this to life, and, and you know, the, all the loud noises and this kind of stuff. And it is one of the most moving experiences I've ever had. And if, and if I watch that on YouTube as a standard film, okay, it's a bit upsetting, but... It, but you kind of you're used to seeing those images in 16.9. Put someone in VR, make them believe they were there, and honestly, the results are staggering. And there's a lot of research that are behind this in terms of how much more charities get out of actually using this as a, as a way of eliciting, eliciting emotion. Um, so yeah, so I, I think Henry touched on this. You know, we really believe this is the future of VR storytelling. Ultimately, VR kind of removes the abstraction layer. It allows you to tell someone in the story in a much subtler way, but in a way that allows you to make someone feel like they experienced that story in a different way. And ultimately, the result of that is they remember that more. And if you are a brand, if you're an advertiser, if you're a marketer, that is so important. And, I, and I'll come on to that in a sec. Um, you know, we believe the leap is as big as the leap from radio to TV. Now, we're not saying this is, you know, it, we're not at the final stage here. You know, I think it's pretty clear that it's still a pretty embryonic industry. But actually, if you look at all of this stuff, and going on to the point Henry made around this doubt around people wearing headsets. I, I, I completely agree, but I, I do think that at all of these stages, someone said, mm, I'm not so sure about that. You know, people said, oh, are we really gonna sit in front of a TV? You know, years ago, are people really gonna wanna sit in front of a box and watch TV? You know, are people really gonna sit uh, at a computer all day typing away? I remember when the iPhone came out, I worked in mobile phones at the time, and people said, I'm not sure people are gonna wanna, you know, tap away on a glass screen. I like my BlackBerry keyboard. And look at it now, you know, and I'm not saying you know, it's going to take a few years in terms of the headset piece, but I honestly believe that as the headsets get better and the adoption gets wider, we will look back and go, I cannot believe we doubted that people would do this. And it might not look like it looks now, but at some point I think we'll look back and it, you know, it will go through the same sort of cycles all of this stuff did. Um, I think this is really important. Um, some of you may have seen this, but this idea of how much more we remember when we personally experience something. Right? If you're there, if we read something, if we hear something, if we see something, there is a limited amount we remember because we just see so much, right? It's just, and I'll come on to that in a second. But actually, it's incredible how much more we remember when we feel like we've experienced something. And that's the key with VR. You trick someone into believing that in their brain into believing they're present in that situation. And therefore, your brain subconsciously remembers this because your brain believes it was an experience you had. So, for example, a lot of people that try, the, we did a bit of content for Man City around uh, a match day experience. So this idea, again, of a ticket you cannot buy. And it's, it's been a great success for them because it took people behind the scenes and it made them believe, you know, especially fans from across the world, it felt that made them feel closer to the club because they're there, they're in the changing room, they're in the, you know, the tunnel, all this kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, it's, again, it's incredibly powerful and incredibly important for, for brands. You know, if you look at today... How, you know, you're all probably well aware of how much marketing, how much advertising, how much noise there is, right? You know, you, you walk down the street, you turn on the telly, you, t you go on Twitter, Facebook. We are bombarded with messages of, of, you know, buy this, buy that, discount here, discount, whatever it may be, right? And, it, and it's, it's mind-boggling just how much we get presented. And I, I saw this, and, it, and this, was a, this was, I think it was a year or so ago. But I think this is really important, you know, we, this, you know, we see something like 5,000 pieces of marketing a day. Now, how on earth, if you're a brand or an advertiser or a marketer, how do you break through that? You know, because, you know, you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, you scroll down, you know, and you just pictures of people's kids and whatever, and then, then it's like an advert, and then you, you just kind of, you know, you, this whole idea of second screening, you're kind of there, but you're not really there. You kind of scroll through and go, yeah, I kind of see that. I, you know, I can get these bloody slippers for five pounds. I get this, right? But, you know, and it does kind of just go one ear and out the other without even realising it. So this whole, kind of our whole idea of, when a brand wants to market and they say, you know, we've got a certain amount of impressions. But yeah, but how many of those people who saw that content actually saw that content? How many of them actually remembered that content and didn't just go, yeah, okay, I get it. And actually, when you look at that in that context, 
what you get in VR is so powerful because you have that undivided attention. This guy here, he's loving life, right? He's having his, he's having his, his milkshake, you know. So when they're there, they're not second screening, right? They're there, you've got them, two, three, four, five minutes. They will be there, they will view that experience. And actually, when you think about the power of that for a brand, you know, you, you're, they're not going to be thinking about what they're having for dinner or, you know, they're not going to be having a, you know, some WhatsApp debate in the, in the background. They're there, you have them, their message with all that power behind VR, what you can translate to them is actually incredibly challenging because at the same time, you have to make sure that when you have their attention, you use it in the, in the best way. And, and going to my earlier point, you use it in a way that really capitalizes on that strength of the platform. You know, you are conveying a clear message. You are telling them, you have to really think about, again, when this, when this chap takes his headset off, what do you want him to do? What is the next step? You know, do you want them to go and buy something? Do you want them to think your brand's really cool? Because now, as VR is a few years old, it is not enough to just do VR. It is not enough for a brand to say, we've done VR, we're cool. It's not enough anymore because everyone's done it, right? So now the challenge is, how do you do it properly? Because actually, there are very few brands that have done it well, genuinely, very few brands that have really done it well. And that is the challenge is that if you can give someone that VR experience, they will associate that with your brand if it's good, which is an incredibly powerful thing. But VR is, you know, is going to be a huge market. Now, there's varying degrees of this, right? There's a lot of this projecting billions of users, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not sure I, I agree on, on all of it. But fundamentally, what they all have in common is that this industry is going to grow and it's going to grow pretty rapidly in the next few years. And again, trillions of market. This is not a 3D TV, right? This is, this is not going anywhere, qu anywhere quickly, right? You see it going away quickly. You see here just how many big companies are invested in this. You know, I mean, when, you know, things like Daydream and Gear VR, when you get to the stage where you can buy a 10, 15 pound a month handset and get a Daydream headset, which, which guarantees a certain quality of experience, which is the problem at the moment, that is going to be massive for the industry and console VR, you know, PlayStation, et cetera. Um, and, and as Henry again touched upon, a lot of this stuff is actually, when you look at the, the usage on these various platforms, it is being driven by cinematic. A lot of it, there's a lot of gaming content on there, but actually a lot of it is driven by cinematic. And also the thing with cinematic VR, it allows you to distribute it far easier. If you've got bespoke interactive applications, you have to build a Unity application for every single one of those and put it on all of the stores and rely on people to download it, which is a very, very tough thing to do. With cinematic content, you can create it, you can distribute it across YouTube, across Facebook. I think you, uh, Facebook said at the Raindance event today, 580 million people have now viewed 360 videos on Facebook, which is incredible. There's a million 360 videos on there. So it's, it, it's still a huge part. And uh, so for us, the in-headset part is one piece, but actually what we do for our clients is we give them a monoscopic 360 edit, which they can deploy across their social channels. So you get the best of both worlds. Just to race through this, um, there's a lot of brands that are already looking at this, you know, McDonald's, North Face, Marriott, we've worked with a hell of a lot of brands that have done this stuff, and it can be from small B2B stuff all the way to huge product launches, um, it really, really varies, and actually what's really exciting, this is a study from Greenlight, you know, actually when a brand uses VR, there's a huge halo effect behind how much more people form a positive opinion, how much more they're likely to buy that product, and again, there's a lot of evidence, this is a study by Nielsen, around actually how much more likely we are to recall that experience, recall that brand. And if you look at that, eight times higher brand recall, 83% enjoyed the experience. And that is massive, that is absolutely massive. 83% of people actually enjoying the experience they've had, rather than going, I don't want to buy a pair of slippers, I don't want to buy a, uh, some shaver for two pounds. Right? You're, you're, it's, incredibly, um, it's incredibly great um, how powerful this is. And again, doubly as likely to share with friends, and we, again, we work in a number of different ways. We have what are called joint originals. This is where we did a film called Invisible, where it was a kind of six-part kind of Hollywood-level thriller directed by Doug Lyman of The Born Identity. And that was a story sponsored by Lexus um, where, and Samsung. That was a kind of really high-end Hollywood production. We do co-productions, and we also do branded content as well. Co-productions, again, can be working with Paul McCartney and, and Great Britain, working with um, ESPN on a, on a kind of a, a Home Depot or Home Depot, on a kind of college game day experience, and also ABC News on a Discovering North Korea bit of content. And that is where we work with people who have already got IP and will help produce that. Um, at the other end of the scale, we do fully branded content, for example, the North Face, a bit of work we did for Hellman's, and also Land Rover, which was a, a three-part series about the America's Cup in Bermuda, where we took, took people to Bermuda, on the boat, you're there with Ben Ainsley, you know, you work, you find out what it's like to be there, really, really exciting bit of content. And again, uh, the North Face was um, 
you know, in the old days, these kind of brands would have said, we're the North Face, here's our clothes, go and buy them, right? I kind of, I kind of think, the, you know, this kind of world of storytelling has changed slightly, and this bit of content was taking you to Nepal, taking you up Everest. Obviously, the people were wearing North Face clothes, but it was a, you're essentially giving someone a really powerful experience, and they happened to be produced by the North Face. So, again, a great way of telling a story, engaging people, but at the same time making sure that your, your brand is, is, is front and centre of that experience. Um, and just the obligatory people we work with slide at the end. Um, so yeah, range of companies, all different types of experiences, big budget, small budget, again, again all around having a clear purpose and, and, and using the power of VR to engage with, with various demographics. Um, and yeah, and uh, I think I must go from the same kind of uh, Google search as Richard did, but yeah, um, time is now um, to uh, utilize this. Um, so if you want to find out more, come and grab me. And that is everything. Thank you very much.